The evolution of powered flight opens up all sorts of possibilities for the animal lineages that achieve this. Being able to take to the skies is an incredibly beneficial ability, enabling animals to move over great distances, feed on new kinds of prey, and access different parts of the environment. Within vertebrates, the animals that have a backbone, true powered flight has independently evolved on three different occasions. Birds and bats are the only powered flyers among these animals alive today. But long before either of those lineages evolved, there were the pterosaurs. These flying reptiles lived alongside the non-avian dinosaurs, and although they were related, they were not dinosaurs themselves. The pterosaurs ruled the ancient skies for over 160 million years and in that time gave rise to the largest flying animals to have ever existed. The biggest of the giant pterosaurs were members of a group called the Ashdarkids. The Ashdarkids appeared in the latter part of the pterosaurs reign, during the Cretaceous period, and include a range of extraordinary species found across the planet such as the North American Quetzalcoatlus, the Romanian Hatsigopteryx, and the Moroccan Phosphatodraco. Ashdarkid pterosaurs first came to the attention of scientists when, in 1939, a huge bone was unearthed along a railroad in Jordan. This bone made its way to the director of a nearby phosphate mine in the 1940s, and then in the 50s was sent to paleontologist Camille Arenborg in France. Upon examining the giant bone, he recognised it as coming from a pterosaur, and identified it as one of the finger bones that make up the wings. Due to the immense size of the bone, he gave it the name Titanopteryx philadelphiae. Titanopteryx meaning Titan Wing. Aremborg made a plaster cast of the huge bone, but then the fate of the original bone itself became lost to history for a few decades, and paleontologists assumed that it had gone missing or was accidentally destroyed. It was then in the 1970s that the next stage of Ashdarkid research began. Paleontologist Douglas Lawson uncovered more giant and mysterious pterosaur bones in Texas, comprising parts of the wings, the hind limbs, neck vertebrae, and bits of jaws, and in 1975 named these fossils as the new species Quetzalcoatlus northropi. Immediately it was recognised as the largest pterosaur so far known to science, as well as the largest flying animal, with an initial estimated wingspan of 15.5 metres, over 50 feet. However, as we'll see, these estimates have since been reined in a little. Once the more complete material of Quetzalcoatlus had been examined and described, paleontologists realised that Aremborg had actually misidentified the giant bone he called Titanopteryx after comparing the known material. Instead of being a wing bone, it was in fact a neck vertebra. But his confusion was understandable, considering that these animals have incredibly unusual neck vertebrae that lack many diagnostic features, and are very simplified tubular structures. Then, in 1989, another error was realised. It turned out that the genus named Titanopteryx was actually already in use for another organism that had been named before the pterosaur, for a genus of black fly. Now, remember that Titanopteryx means Titan wing, so not only does this whole taxonomic debacle continue to annoy pterosaur fans to this day, but it's also incontrovertible proof that entomologists do indeed have a sense of humour. Instead of Titanopteryx, this pterosaur was therefore renamed Aramborgiania philadelphiae, in honour of Camille Aramborg. The 80s saw many other advances in our understanding of these magnificent pterosaurs too, as in 1984 the species Ajdarko lancicollis was described from Uzbekistan, and the name of the whole group was taken from it when paleontologists realised that this species, Quetzalcoatlus and Aramborgiania, were all related. Ajdarko got its name from the Uzbek word Ajdarko, a sort of mythological dragon and a perfect description for these enormous ancient flyers. Since the 1980s, many new species of Ashdarkid pterosaurs have continued to be named, and today include over 20 different species, although, as usual with paleontology, the classification of some have been questioned. Our modern understanding of Ashdarkidae includes species of varying dimensions, ranging from Montana's Darko with a 2.5 metre wingspan, to several species that seem to fall in the 3 to 6 metre wingspan range, such as Ashdarko itself, the smaller species of Quetzalcoatlus named in 2021, Quetzalcoatlus lawsoni, Zhejiang opterus from China, and others. Slightly larger species are known too, achieving wingspans of up to 9 meters, such as Thanatos dracon described in 2022 from Argentina. And then, there are the absolute giants of the ancient skies, the largest of the Ashdarkids, all with estimated wingspans of around 10 meters, and potentially even some that were slightly bigger. 
These giants include Ketelqualus Northropi, Hatsigopteryx Thambema from Romania, Cryodracon Boreas from Canada, and potentially Aramborgiania, though the estimates do vary. There's also an unnamed and very fragmentary Ashdarkid from Mongolia too, which seems to be in the running for the largest pterosaur as well. So what was the anatomy of these enormous flying reptiles like? How did it enable them to grow to such huge dimensions and yet still take to the air? The most notable aspect of the general Ashdarkid body plan is the length of the neck in relation to the body, as well as the size of the skull. The neck vertebrae of Ashdarkids were very unusual compared to many other animals, and even compared to other pterosaur groups. Proportionally, they have the longest necks of any pterosaurs, and this is due to the elongation of the individual cervical vertebrae. <laughs> As I have before me here a cast of the Aramborgiania cervical, and you can see this incredible tube-like structure. You should know this too. Additionally, they have a structure referred to as a tube within a tube, resulting from the fact that the neural canal is actually incorporated into the center of the body of the vertebra and runs all the way through it, instead of running through a neural arch formed beneath a projecting neural spine. This condition is also observed in another pterosaur group, the Sungareptorids, but is otherwise very different to other pterosaurs. The extreme reduction of the neural spine, which is present as a low ridge running down the length of the vertebrae, also contributes to the overall tubular shape of these bones. Incredibly, research looking at the internal structure of Ashdarkid neck vertebrae has found that these bones have a microarchitecture that significantly strengthens them. Using X-ray CT scanning to peer inside the vertebra of the Moroccan Ashdarkid Alanka, paleontologists found that around the central canal running through it, the bone was hollow but had many small columns of bone called trabeculae arranged in a helical pattern. These trabeculae were found to increase the buckling load of the bone significantly, and the neural canal running through the center also added to the strength of the vertebra. This means that although these bones were very long and might look like they could break easily, they were actually remarkably strong and could deal with stresses from picking up heavy prey items, in addition to being relatively very lightweight and therefore still allowing the animal to take flight. Now, I have here before me a fantastic model of Quetzalcoatlus itself, made by Wonder Artistic Models, a company based in Chile, which creates scientifically accurate 3D wooden puzzles of prehistoric and living animals. I'll be talking more about them at the end of the video, as they very kindly sent me this model for free, and I wanted to show you some of the extreme Ashdarkid anatomy using this amazing model of the skeleton. You can see here the very long, tubular shape of the elongated neck vertebrae, atop which sits this proportionally huge skull. But this giant skull is clearly very lightly constructed, and this large open space that you can see here is called the nasal and torbital fenestra, which is the result of the opening for the nares, the nose hole basically, and the antorbital fenestra, an opening in front of the eyes, merging into one large opening. Behind the nasal and torbital fenestra, you can see the much smaller orbit where the eye would sit. Our knowledge of the skull anatomy of most Ashdarkids is unfortunately rather limited, as these parts of the animals only rarely fossilize. However, in some cases, the skull, or parts of it, do get preserved. In the Chinese taxon Zhejiangopterus, described in 1994, a complete skull is preserved, providing us with some invaluable information on what these pterosaurs' heads would have looked like. In addition, some cranial remains of Quetzalcoatlus itself are known too, However, they're not from the giant Quetzalcoatlus Northropi. Instead, all the skull material comes from the smaller and much more recently named Quetzalcoatlus Lawsoni, described in 2021. So what did these skulls look like? In general, they were very long and lightly built with entirely toothless jaws, and essentially can be thought of as giant triangles when viewed from the sides. The jaws were very slender and seemed to have not had particularly impressive bite forces suggesting that instead of being suited for subduing large struggling prey, they were better adapted for picking up and processing smaller or immobile prey items. However, some Ashdarkids appear to have had a different overall jaw shape. While Ketelquatlus and Zhejiangopterus had long, low jaws, other species such as Wellenhopterus, also named in 2021, had relatively shorter and deeper jaws, suggesting that there was quite a bit of variation in the precise feeding strategy and anatomy among these pterosaurs. Adding to this variability is the fact that the limited skull remains that are known of the giant Romanian species Hatsigopteryx indicate an unusually robust skull for this animal. Here is a cast of one of the known skull pieces, which is a bit of the base of the skull. You can see here, this is where it fit into the socket. 
and also part of the underside of the skull where the lower jaw would attach to. And unlike most other pterosaur skulls with their thin struts and plates of bone, Hatsugopteryx had very robust bones with strong ridges indicating large muscle attachments, though the skull would still have had big openings to keep it light enough for flight. Indeed, this idea of Hatsugopteryx as a particularly robust Ashdarkid was further expanded upon when, in 2017, paleontologists described a neck vertebra from Romania that they assigned to this Ashdarkid. This vertebra is proportionally short and thick in comparison to other Ashdarkid neck bones, especially when compared to the only other known giant neck vertebra, the one from Aramborgiania. As such, it's been hypothesized that Hatsigopteryx was a stocky, short-necked Ashdarkid capable of taking on violently struggling prey, with a robust neck that could handle the torsion and compression involved in such activities. Given the absence of any large dinosaur predators in its environment too, which was an ancient island ecosystem, paleontologists have proposed that Hatsigopteryx was the arch-predator of its habitat, predating on small dinosaurs. Meanwhile, the hypothesis goes, Aramborgiani would have had a very different ecology with its proportionally longer and more slender neck, and perhaps even had a completely different diet. However, other paleontologists have advised caution when comparing the neck vertebrae of Aramborgiania and Hatsigopteryx, since the Aramborgiania bone is likely a fifth cervical vertebra, while the Hatsigopteryx specimen is thought to be a seventh cervical meaning the Hatsugopteryx bone comes from closer to the base of the neck and would be expected to be proportionally shorter compared to the middle neck vertebrae anyway. In addition, it's been pointed out that the biomechanical influence of the internal structures of the vertebrae were not fully considered, and which are now understood to greatly increase the loads that these bones are capable of sustaining. Another notable feature of Ashdarkid skulls is the crest at the back of the head, at least in some species. The completely preserved skull of Zhejiang Opterus shows that this species, and therefore presumably some other Ashdarkids too, lacked any kind of display crest above the nasal antorbital fenestra. However, the partial skulls of the smaller Quetzalcoatl species, Quetzalcoatlus lawsoni, hint at some sort of structure having been present above the large openings of the skull. These structures are incompletely preserved, however, and we don't know the exact extent of them, and as such you'll see a lot of variation in the shape and size of these crests in various paleoartistic reconstructions of the pterosaurs. Plus, since we don't have these regions of the skulls in the giant Ashdarkids, such as the larger Quetzalcoatlus Northropi, Hatsigopteryx, or Aramborgiania, the presence of crests in these animals is speculative, but not unreasonable. I really like the crest shape of this model though, as they've gone for a fairly conservative design, sticking close to the shape and maximum extent of the structure and the actual preserved material. As well as neck vertebrae and occasional skull pieces, one of the other key parts of the skeleton that help paleontologists to figure out the maximum sizes and biomechanics of the extraordinary Ashdarkids is the humerus. Fortunately, fossils of these upper arm bones are actually known for some of the giant species. A very well-preserved Quetzalcoatlus Northropi humerus is known, as well as a partial Hatsigopteryx humerus. The most striking feature of these very robust and stout bones is the extremely expanded process near the head, called the deltopectoral crest. As in other pterosaur groups, the crest is very long, reaching about half the length of the entire humerus, making the whole bone look somewhat like a hatchet. These crests were the attachment points for the major flight muscles, and in Quetzalcoatlus Northropi, this crest is the largest of any pterosaur. The partial humerus known of Hatsigopteryx is also an incredibly robust bone and needed to be very strong to support and move those enormous wings, especially during launching. Next to the deltopectoral crest is the partially weathered humeral head, which is really quite massive for a solid articulation with the body. And then there is a part of the actual shaft. The shaft is remarkably wide for a flying animal, but again when you consider how powerful the wing muscles it supports would need to be, it makes sense. Now it was actually due to the similarities seen between this humerus and the previously described humerus of Quetzalcoatlus that, in 2002, Hatsigopteryx was recognised as representing another giant Ashdarkid. The long and gently curved crest lacking a bulbous expansion at the end was noted by paleontologists to look very similar to the condition in Quetzalcoatlus, and so it was clear that they had another flying giant here. And just to show how amazingly detailed this model of Quetzalcoatlus is, here on the humerus, you can even see the deltopectoral crest sticking out near the humeral head. It's a really nice little detail. So then, it's clear that Ashdarkid pterosaurs, as the largest flying animals that ever lived, had some pretty extreme anatomy. But exactly how big did they get? 
As I hinted at before, the upper limit of the Ajdarkid wingspan seems to balance out at approximately 10 meters, or almost 33 feet. Although previous estimates have gone as high as 20 meters, this is just a little bit ridiculous and is not thought to be the case any longer. Nevertheless, 10 meters is still absolutely incredible and safely puts these pterosaurs far above the size ranges of any other groups of flying animals. When Quetzalcoatlus was first described in 1975 by Douglas Lawson, he compared the giant humerus to the same bones in a variety of other pterosaur species in order to estimate the full size of the animal. Scaling it up with these different species resulted in a range of wingspans going from 11 meters based on the Jurassic aged Pterodactylus to 15.5 meters based on Sungaripterus and Pteranodon, and then even an extreme maximum estimate of 21 meters when it was scaled up using an observed trend for other pterosaurs. However, he accepted the 15.5 measurement as the most likely. Revised estimates in the 1980s then brought the Quetzalcoatlus Northropi wingspan down to around 12 meters, and more recent work has since found that a 10 to 11 meter wingspan for this animal is the maximum that we can reliably calculate for it, largely based on scaling up from the more complete Quetzalcoatlus lawsoni material. Hatsigopteryx was initially estimated to have a total wingspan of 10 to 12 meters, and hence to have been slightly larger than Quetzalcoatlus northropi, as the humerus was measured as being about 10 millimeters wider than the Quetzalcoatlus material. Therefore, it was thought that the total length of the humerus was slightly bigger in Hatsigopteryx, which then scaled up to a slightly bigger total wingspan. However, it turns out that the Hatsigopteryx humerus has actually been deformed a bit during the process of fossilization, and the delta pectoral crest has actually been bent out of place. When this deformation is taken into account, the width of the humerus is then about the same as that of Quetzalcoatlus northropi, suggesting that actually these two pterosaurs potentially had very similar wingspans, at least based on what paleontologists have been able to tell from the limited material we have available. The wingspan of Aramborgiania has also been discussed and estimated several times, although considering that only a neck vertebra is attributed with certainty to this pterosaur, it makes calculating a reliable wingspan somewhat difficult. Although there is an Ashdarkid arm bone that was found in Morocco which has been suggested to belong to Aramborgiania, though this is uncertain. Plus there is actually a fragmentary neck vertebra discovered in Tennessee that paleontologists have argued is also Aramborgiania, massively extending its range. But anyway, the wingspan estimates given for Aramborgiania have ranged from 13 meters, as estimated by paleontologists in the 1990s, based on scaling with the smaller Quetzalcoatlus species, to just 7 meters, as estimated in the early 2000s. However, it seems that both of these are probably too extreme, and Aramborgiania likely had a wingspan more in the range of Quetzalcoatlus northropi, at around 10 meters. But again, this is a particularly challenging species to make estimates for, given how limited its known material is. Another giant Ashdarkid species was named in 2019, from material found in late Cretaceous aged rocks in Alberta, Canada. This is Cryodracon boreas, the name meaning cold dragon of the north winds, and it's actually known from quite a bit of fossil material for an Ashdarkid. The specimens of this species include bones from several individuals and altogether include neck vertebrae, wing bones, parts of the hind limbs, and bits of the pectoral girdle. In the paper describing Cryodracon, it's noted that the humerus of this Canadian species is remarkably similar to that of Quetzalcoatlus, suggesting that this pterosaur was also of comparable size to the largest of the Ashdarkids. However, the authors also suggest that, given the slightly longer humerus in Cryodracon, this species may have been slightly bulkier and had a greater body mass, which is also supported by the relatively more robust neck vertebrae. Of course, as I briefly mentioned earlier, there's yet another Ashdarkid species that's also in the running for the largest flying animal ever, the very fragmentary remains from late Cretaceous aged rocks in the Gobi Desert of Mongolia. These fossils consist of a partial neck vertebra along with two fragments of neural arches, and due to this very limited material, the paleontologists who described it decided not to give it a scientific name. However, they describe the bones as being comparable in size to other giant Ashdarkids, and therefore in the range of 10 meters or slightly more. Unfortunately for now, this is about all we can say about the size of the Mongolian giant until more remains are hopefully found in the future. It's interesting to note though that this enormous pterosaur also seems to have coexisted with Tyrannosaurs, since fossils of Tarbosaurus batar have been recovered from the same locality hinting at some interesting potential interactions between these very different but very large predators. 
Other fragmentary and as yet unnamed large Ashdarkid remains have also been recovered from late Cretaceous Age deposits in Spain and in France. A neck vertebra reported from the French Pyrenees in 1997 was estimated to have come from an animal with a wingspan in the range of 9 meters, while the wingspan of another pterosaur known from limited remains near Valencia in Spain has apparently been estimated at over 12 meters, although there's not much information available about these claims. So, wingspans of 10 meters, or perhaps a tiny bit more, seem to have been about the maximum that was possible for Ashdarkids to achieve, and therefore also set the upper limit for any flying animal. However, there's always the potential for more discoveries of Ashdarkid remains to increase this upper limit, although probably not by too much. But, there's a very intriguing specimen that has recently been revealed and gone on display in Germany, which potentially could represent the largest of all Ashdarkids. This is a specimen given the nickname Dracula, unearthed in Transylvania in Romania, and claimed to be the largest ever pterosaur. Although its fossils have not been published yet, reconstructions of the skeleton of this enormous flying reptile were put up on display at the Altmutal Dinosaur Museum in Germany. I was lucky enough to visit here in May of 2023, which you can see more of in our Boneheads video about our field trip to Germany. And so here I am with Dr. Nizar Ibrahim talking about these magnificent pterosaurs. So I'm here with Dr. Nizar Ibrahim and uh, behind us is a specimen of Ashdarkid called Dracula. Um, so I thought you could tell us a little bit about this specimen. Um, where did it come from and what do you think it might be? Yeah, so there are only a few tantalizing clues we have for giant yeah. Ashdarkids, right? The best one is, of course, the Texas giant, mm. Quetzalcoatlus, right? Everything's bigger in Texas, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, but then we have bits and pieces from places like Spain. There's something called the oh, okay. La Solana giant, which is only known from a few neck bones. Oh, wow. Um, there's some big uh, uh, bones from, from uh, Jordan. Mm. And then there's Romania. And this is based on material that was found in Romania and it's from Transylvania. So yeah. what's the first thing you think about when you hear Transylvania? <laughs> Vampires. Vampires, right? Yeah. So it's nicknamed Dracula. Yeah. And it was um, you know, announced to the world as, as the largest pterosaur ever, um, even bigger than Quetzalcoatlus. Mm. And so what you see here is you know, um, based on um, different kinds of large pterosaurs. The material is relatively limited, but it's very, very big, yeah. right? So um, there's a neck bone, of, held the original, oh, cool. it's absolutely enormous, <laughs> right? Um, there are bits of the wrist, again, yeah. off the scale. And so we recently did some work to um, put together a more precise, more accurate reconstruction of this giant yeah. Ashdarkid, um, Dracula, essentially. Yeah. We think that it's probably a, a pterosaur called Hatsigopteryx, right. which yeah. is known from Romania. There's just no overlap in the material, right? So the question okay. is, you know, whether two giant pterosaurs, right? Or, or yeah. Um, but it might well be Hatsigopteryx. And so what we did is we looked at the material that has been published for Quetzalcoatlus mm. and um, other larger Ashdarkid pterosaurs. And we pieced together what is really the first scientifically accurate representation of a giant Ashdarkid, at least based on what we know yeah. um, today. And so it comes out at, you know, 11.4 meters in wingspan, roughly. Wow. So this is a really, really big animal. And yeah. it, it just blows your mind, right? Because, it's, um, you know, if you're standing in front of this thing, you can't help but just imagine what this yeah. would have looked like in the flesh. And, you know. So have you, have you ever seen a, a giant Ashdarkid reconstruction of, <laughs> I haven't, of that sort? I haven't seen one where it's actually on the ground. Yeah. And I, I've always wanted to. Because I feel like when, when up in the, the air like that, like they, they yeah. look impressive, but having it like right in front of you like this, you can really get a sense of the scale. Yeah. So this is really impressive to see. Yeah. So Dracula will be very interesting to see published, and may even end up pushing the maximum wingspan limit a little further. But all these huge wingspan estimates have also been accompanied by calculations of these pterosaurs' masses, along with the odd claim that such giant animals were actually not capable of flying at all, and were instead flightless pterosaurs. Some researchers in the early 2000s suggested that pterosaurs with 10 meter wingspans would have needed to be extraordinarily lightweight in order to fly, limited to a maximum of about 70 kilograms. However, this is just not realistic given that more recent mass estimates for the largest Ashdarkids put them at between 200 and 250 kilograms, far above the claimed 70 kilogram cap. 
Other estimates by different paleontologists had previously predicted masses of 544 kilograms for giant Ajdarkids, but this was found to be a huge overestimate. The issue was that many of these older estimates and claimed limits for pterosaur masses had been relying too heavily on comparisons to birds. As argued by other paleontologists in 2010, the anatomy, wing structure and method of launch in birds and pterosaurs are very different from each other, and I've discussed all this at length in my previous videos on Ashdarkids. Essentially though, all the evidence points towards giant Ashdarkids indeed having been capable of flying, and suggests that they were perfectly able to launch themselves into the air without relying on a long run-up or a launch from a cliff, as had variously been suggested in the past. So then, the Ashdarkids are the undeniable victors when it comes to the largest flying animals, and as far as we can tell from their incredibly limited remains, the title for largest ever flying animal is probably somewhat of a tie between Quetzalcoatlus, Hatsigopteryx, Cryodracon, maybe Aramborgiania, and perhaps some of the other fragmentary unnamed species. The thing we must always remember about the fossil record, however, is that we're only seeing a tiny, tiny sample of all of the organisms that actually ever lived, especially in the case of these fragmentary Ashdarkids known from only a handful of specimens. And so we're very unlikely to have the absolute largest individuals of any species represented as fossils. This means that there's always the chance that there were particular individuals of any one of these species that may have grown slightly larger than all of the others. And so the biggest flying animal that has ever lived is almost certainly one that we have no record of and never will. So all those giant Ashdarkids are pretty solid contenders for the largest ever based on what we know, considering that they're all in the same size range. But very quickly before we end this video, how about the other kinds of flying animals? The birds, the bats, and the insects. What were their largest flyers? Among the birds, the biggest wingspan we know of belongs to an extinct species called Pelagornus sandersi, which lived during the late Oligocene epoch between 28 and 25 million years ago. Known from a partial skeleton and skull unearthed in South Carolina, this species was named in 2014 and is a member of the Pelagornithids, the so-called pseudotooth birds, named for their tooth-like projections on their upper and lower jaws that were actually extensions of their bones, not true teeth since these were lost in bird ancestors. Pelagornis sandersi is estimated to have a total wingspan of around 6.4 meters, although the estimates range from 6.06 .06 to almost 7.4 meters. This just about beats the previous avian record holder, the massive Argentavis magnificens from the late Miocene of Argentina, which lived more recently about 6 million years ago. Argentavis was a member of the extinct Teratornithids, relatives of New World vultures and storks, and had a wingspan that may have reached up to 7 meters, so it was still on the same sort of scale as Pelagornis sandersi. It's interesting to note that the maximum known sizes for flying birds seem to be significantly smaller than the maximum in pterosaurs, and this has been the subject of some discussion among researchers. It's been hypothesized to have something to do with the very different launching biomechanics of the two groups, Whereas birds are bipedal launchers, pterosaurs were most likely quad launchers, with their arms providing most of the forces needed to get them off the ground. This essentially meant that pterosaurs were comparably much more efficient with their body mass, as their large launching and flight muscles were all concentrated around the pectoral girdle, while birds launch with their hind limbs and flap with their forelimbs meaning their muscle mass is spread around the pectoral as well as pelvic girdle. Moving over to the third group of vertebrates with true powered flight, what is the biggest bat? Well, the one with the largest wingspan that we know of is actually a living species, called the giant golden-crowned flying fox, Acerodon jubatus, an inhabitant of the Philippines. This bat is a member of the megabat lineage, which includes the fruit bats and other flying foxes, and has a reported wingspan of up to 1.7 meters and a body mass of 1.4 kilograms. Some of the other contenders for largest bat include some species of the genus Teropus, such as the Indian flying fox and the great flying fox, both of which weigh slightly more than the giant golden crowned flying fox, but have reported wingspans that are a little smaller. Considering that bat fossils are notoriously rare and often very poorly preserved, particularly in the case of the megabats, which generally live in tropical regions where fossilization is less likely, it wouldn't surprise me if there was some kind of prehistoric megabat that had an even larger wingspan, but we'll have to wait and see if anything like that ever gets found. Again, it's very interesting to note that the maximum size for bats seems to be much smaller than that of birds, and far, far smaller than that of pterosaurs, 
This has been suggested to have something to do with their inherent mammalian structure, with different anatomical and metabolic constraints applying to them compared to the other groups of flying vertebrates. In addition, a study that investigated why bat maximum size is relatively small found that in similar sized bats and birds, the mass of the downstroke flight muscles is less in bats, seeming to indicate that the general anatomy and layout of muscles in bats is a contributing factor to their limited maximum sizes. Not that this in any way suggests that they are somehow not a successful group. After all, size isn't everything, as shown by the fact that there are over 1,400 living species of bats, making them the second most diverse order of mammals after the rodents. And finally, what about the fourth group of animals with powered flight, and the first ones to take to the air, the insects? The honour of the largest flying insect, as well as the largest insect in general, goes to a species called Meganeuropsis permiana, which lived during the Permian period around 285 million years ago, and has been found as fossils in Kansas and Oklahoma. You may have heard of Meganeura, the famous giant from the even older Carboniferous period often referred to as a giant dragonfly. Meganeura is also a member of the same group as Meganeuropsis, called Meganosoptera, but they are not true dragonflies, instead belonging to an entirely extinct lineage known as griffinflies. Both Meganeura and Meganeuropsis were absolute giants in terms of insect size, although Meganeuropsis is known from slightly larger fossil specimens, reaching a maximum wingspan of 71 centimeters, while the maximum for Meganeura has been cited as about 70 centimeters. Now, considering that the wingspan of the common gull can be around 110 centimeters, that's pretty impressive to think that these insects were not far off, and they would have been marvelous animals to see in life. So then, those are the largest flying animals that have ever lived, as far as we know. Before we end this video though, I'd like to thank Wanda Artistic Models for sending me this fantastic Quartless model. As I already mentioned, this model includes loads of amazing and accurate anatomical details that can be used to learn more about this incredible animal. Wanda Artistic Models is a company based in Chile that creates some absolutely stunning 3D wooden puzzles of extinct and living animals that aim to be as accurate as possible. I had so much fun putting this Kettle Koalas model together, and they also sent me a Velociraptor too, which looks amazing as well. There are multiple different postures that you can make for each model, and I love how the jaws are movable as well, allowing you to create some pretty dynamic poses. As they say on their website, they create paleo art, not toys, and they truly do make a brilliant addition to any paleontology lover's collection. I'd highly recommend having a look at their website, which will be linked below. There's an extraordinary range of animals that you can put together, including the recently added multiple variations of Spinosaurus as a swimmer, and also as a heron-like riverbank hunter, just so you can cover all your bases in the Spinosaurus debate. It's a very clever idea. Thank you so much again to Wonder Artistic Models for sending me these amazing models, and I hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you for watching this video, and I hope you learned something new. If you would like to find out more about our world, its history, and the wonderful life that surrounds us all, please feel free to subscribe to the channel if you think we deserve it, and if you would like to see more from us.